Please rise. May the gracious love of God our Father, love that is full, free, and forgiving, be with you now and always. Amen. The word of God that we consider from our epistle reading, the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 24 to 28. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face the judgment, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Please be seated. In your own mind, I just want you to fill in the blank, okay? Change is dot, dot, dot. You bought a new computer or you got a new phone. You accepted a new job. You received a promotion. You moved into a new house. You changed your major at school. Change is exciting, fun. Change is frightening, depressing. I think a lot of times when you change, it's kind of exciting just to see what this change is all going to entail. But sometimes when you get into the change, you're going, oh, why did I do this? Why can't I go back to the old way? Kind of what the the people of the Hebrews were facing. The people who received this letter, as God directed and dictated through an unknown author, had been, and I hope you understand when I say this, they had been Jews. They had worshipped in accordance with the Jewish traditions. I mean, the priests, the animal sacrifices, the Sabbath day regulations, all of the special festival days. But then by God's grace, someone had come in contact with them who shared with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And they came to understand Jesus is our Savior. They were led to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And that was absolutely fantastic. But now in this period of time, the leader of the Roman Empire was a guy named Nero. And what Nero did is he outlawed Christianity. And he allowed Judaism to still be a a recognized religion. So these Hebrews who had been the followers of the old Jewish way, who are now Christians, were facing persecution. They were facing confiscation of property. They were facing maybe even imprisonment or death. And and so it was very tempting for them to change, to go back to their old ways of worship. And so this whole letter to the Hebrews was written as a great big encouragement to hang on. To continue to hang on to Jesus in the face of no matter what it is that you're going to encounter. And and so many different reasons given throughout the book of Hebrews, but in these four verses, one specific reason to hang on to Jesus. And that's this. Jesus is superior And you see that Jesus is is superior in three different ways. First, in what he did for us. Then is where he is at right now. And finally, then, in what he provides for his people. When we stop to consider what Jesus has done for us, what Jesus has done for the world, you can't help but realize that Jesus truly is superior. We simply read this, Now, but now he, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And again, later on in this section, we read this, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. 
That's the work of Jesus Christ. He came here to provide for us, to secure for us, forgiveness. Forgiveness for every sin that we have ever committed. And I sometimes wonder if, if we really understand the ramifications of sin in our life. It's so easy for us to just say about the sin that we commit, well, that's just who I am. I'm a foul mouth. I tell dirty jokes. I lie a lot. I blow off God's word way too often than I should, but, but that's just who I am. I can't help it, and you've got to accept me for, for who I am. <clears throat> or we buy into the, the rationale of the world today. We take that physical advice into our spiritual life, and you know what people say today is what? Just do your best. Just do your best. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's wonderful. Every parent, every teacher, every coach wants their child, their student, their athlete to do their best at home, in the classroom, in the music room, on the athletic field. Do your best. But sadly then we try and draw that into our spiritual life and we say, God will be happy if I do my best. And so God, God, I have kept half of the commandments half of the time. God, that's the very best that I can do. You've got to accept me for that, God. You've got to love me for that, God. You've got to receive me into your family for that, God. And then God gently says, but I demand perfection. And then our God quietly reminds us that whoever keeps the whole law, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, he is guilty of breaking it all. And he lovingly reminds us all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory, the standard of the praise, have fallen short of the glory of God. And then with a heart that is absolutely aching for his dear children, he reminds the world and us of the results of our sin, that that wage for sin is going to be death. And then with even more pain in his heart, he reminds us that after death, because of unrepented sin, there will be an eternity in a place called hell suffering is intense. And so what an absolute joy to be able to open up to the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews to look at the 28th verse and hear our God say to us, but Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. God demands that I be perfect and I tell my Father in Heaven I can't. But Jesus was for me. God demands that I suffer the, the righteous punishment, His anger for the sins that I have committed. And I say, God, I can't. He says, but Jesus did for you when he suffered hell on the cross. God demands that I offer a ransom for myself for the sins that I have committed. And I say, God, I, I can't do that. And God says, but Jesus did for you when he died on the cross. And so our Heavenly Father looks at us and he says, because of what Jesus did for you, because of what Jesus did, I, I forgive you. That means that there's no outstanding of debt of sin yet to be paid. That means that there's no stain, no smudge, no smear of sin that still needs to be washed off of us. We are forgiven. 
all of our sins. That's, that is the work of Jesus. And these Hebrews want to walk away from that. They want to go back to the Old Testament priest. They want to go back to that Old Testament animal sacrifice. Yeah, that's what God wanted them to do in the Old Testament. But understand what all of that was. It was nothing more than a, a graphic picture. It was nothing more than a commercial telling the people what was going to come, namely Jesus. Jesus who would die on that cross. Jesus who would get rid of all of their sins. You Hebrew people, what do you want? Do you want the picture? Do you want the commercial? Do you want the reality? Hang on. Hang on to Jesus. When you understand what Jesus did for you, you realize that he is superior to everyone and anything else. Jesus is superior, not just because of what he did, but because of where he is. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the holy place, the most holy place, every year with blood that is not his own. The Old Testament high priest, what he did was simply commanded by God. The Old Testament high priest went in once a year on the great day of atonement, went into this room called the most holy place. And that most holy place represented heaven. In that most holy place, he stood before the Ark of the Covenant, an ornate box that simply represented the God. And when that high priest went into that replica of heaven and stood before what represented God, he took goat blood. Goat blood that represented the blood of the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And he sprinkled it on that Ark of the Covenant. And all that did was picture forgiveness. It did absolutely nothing to forgive. So why, Hebrews? Do you want to let go of Jesus? Realize where Jesus is right now and what Jesus is doing right now. We're told in these verses that Jesus is in heaven. And that alone should give us every reason to want to hang on to him. Do you realize what it means to know that Jesus is in heaven? When Jesus lived on this earth, he lugged around all of our sins because God laid on him the iniquity of us all because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He lugged all those sins around. And you know what sin does, right? It separates you from God. You cannot be in God's presence if you have sin on you. So the fact that Jesus stands in heaven and stands in the presence of his Father in heaven means what? That all of those sins are gone. That God accepted the perfect life of Jesus. That God accepted the blood of Jesus. That God accepted the death of Jesus Christ as payment for every one of our sins. You know what that means? My guilt vanishes. My fear evaporates. My worry disintegrates. You know why? I'm forgiven. I am forgiven. And realize what Jesus, as he stands before his heavenly Father in heaven, is doing. In the book of John, the, the, uh, uh, the epistle of John, John wrote this, If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You know what the devil does all the time? He accuses us of our sin to our heavenly Father. And in our life, we give him tons of ammunition so that he can accuse us. And as our Father in heaven hears those accusations, he has no choice but to condemn us to hell. But there in heaven stands our Savior, Jesus Christ. He stands in heaven, not a replica of heaven. He stands before our Heavenly Father, not before a box that represents our Father in heaven. He stands with His blood, not goat's blood. And He says, look, Father, what I did. 
And his father says, I see what you did. And then he declares us forgiven. He turns a deaf ear to the devil's accusations and he declares us to be forgiven of every one of our sins. Hang on to Jesus. Don't let go of him. Don't let your own pride get in the way. Don't let the lies of this world get in your way. You know, so many times we are puffed up with pride and we just think, you know, I am a, a decent person. We listen to the lies of this world that say what? God is love. And because God is love, He would never, ever, ever, ever punish anyone with the eternal tortures of hell. And we would say, you know what? You're absolutely right. God is love. But we also understand the truth about our God that He's just. Just like the Hoyts love their children, the Hoyts are just and they're going to punish their children if they do anything wrong. And so God loves us. But He's also a just God. And He says the soul that sins is a soul that shall die. He will punish us. But praise God that Jesus said, no, I'm carrying their sin. That Jesus said, no, don't punish them. Punish me. And God the Father did. <coughs> and that means that you and I were forgiven. Let go of your pride. Let go of the lies of this world and hang on to Jesus because He is superior. Just as we look where He is in heaven and what He's doing there for us. He's superior. He will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. It's prepared. Your place in heaven is prepared. Jesus says, I'm coming back on that day we know to be judgment day. And I'm going to bring salvation to those who are waiting those who are waiting mean those who trust in Jesus, who believe in Jesus, who love Jesus. Jesus is bringing salvation to those who love Him. And just for a moment again, I ask you to do this. In a word or two or three, no more than four, I want you to just picture in your mind, think to yourself, what is heaven going to be like? So just do that right now. Picture in your mind what you believe heaven to be like. You know what it is? It's no more sickness, no more cold, no more flu, no more allergies, no more asthma. It's no more cancer or stroke, no more heart attack, no more MS, no more Parkinson's. It's no more sadness, it's no more despair, it's no more anger, it's no more worry. It's no more shootings. It's no more fighting. It's no more anger. It's no more politics. It's no more natural disasters. It's no more death. It's no more separation. It's no more temptation. It's no more devil. The psalmist in such a simple, lovely way tells us what heaven is like when he said, you will fill me with joy 
in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. That's prepared. That is waiting for you. That is what Jesus is going to bring to you on that last day. And so Hebrews, why? Why would you ever think of giving that up and going back to a, a human priest and a building an animal's blood that did nothing, really. What about us? I mean, there are so many things in this world that captivate us, <laughs> that draw our attention, that take our time, that we want to do, that we want to enjoy, and it's all good, wholesome, wonderful things, but, but to what extent do they captivate us? And to what extent do they take our time? And then we need to ask ourselves, all these things of this world, what eternal benefit do they have for me? Jesus is superior. Let go. Let go. And then hang on to Jesus as you remember what he has done for you. Hang on to Jesus as you remember where he is right now. Hang on to Jesus. So that you can hang out with Jesus. In that heaven. That you have pictured. In your mind. Amen. Please rise.